Thank you so much to Jack Forbes Wilson for being with us today and for that beautiful rendition of Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's online worship service. I'm Reverend Jennifer Nordstrom, and I'm honored to serve as First Church's senior minister. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies here. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit. We welcome all that you're carrying with you today and all your heart longs to set down. During the COVID-19 public health emergency, all First Church in-person activities have moved online or they've been rescheduled. We offer all ages religious education at 10 a.m. and youth group at 1 p.m. on Sundays online. You can find the link to join in your RE weekly updates. Sign up for that update to find more about religious education for children and family ministry including ways to connect with our families, our faith, and our community every week. Join us for a virtual coffee hour this morning after service at 10 a.m. or 12 p.m., where we'll chat in small groups on video conference. You can find the Zoom meeting link in the live stream chat, as well as in your Friday e-announcements. Your password is UUMKE. Members, Guests and visitors are all welcome. The forum today is online at 1010 a.m. with Bruce Zahn, a consultant and advocate of energy con conservation, educating about efficient and affordable passive houses. The link to join that Zoom is in your announcements and now in your live chat. General Assembly. Our Unitarian Universalist Association's General Assembly is virtual and affordable this year. Registration is only $150, and if you want to attend as a First Church delegate, we will pay the registration. There are a lot of workshop options with virtual engagement, and Naomi Klein will be the WARE lecturer. Contact Bruce Wiggins for more information. Next Sunday is our annual flower communion worship service. Our ritual this year will involve virtual flower sharing. So please send me a photo of the flower that you want to bring with you to church by this Tuesday morning, June 2nd. And be sure to download the PDF coloring page of First Church and Flowers from your announcements and have that page or just a blank piece of paper and some coloring tools with you for our service next Sunday, June 7th. Once again, I welcome you to our worship service by inviting you to repeat our mission after me. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. It's been quite a week, First Church loved ones. It really has, the hits just keep on coming. And I've been thinking of you so much this week. These words, these opening words are excerpted from the Reverend Dr. Ron Bell, pastor of Camphor United Methodist Church in St. Paul and his essay, Do Not Look Away. My city is burning but not the way the media is showing. Do you see the fire? Not the one burning down the precinct, but the one burning in the hearts of the wounded in my community. The grieving mothers and grandmothers recalling the voice of our dear brother, George Floyd. Did you see that fire? Did you see the shattered glass? Not those easily replaceable windows scattered in pieces on the ground under our feet. Instead, the shattered glass of expectation for justice 
a shattered glass of respect for our humanity that our murderers continue to display a shattered glass of hope as we watched our bloody brother's body lay lifeless. Did you see that glass shatter? Don't be so busy looking for a riot that you miss the gathering of the grieving. Don't be so busy looking for looters that you miss the lament and the heartbreak of a community. Don't be so busy looking for trouble that you miss the tragedy of systemic racialized trauma on the bodies of black and brown people. Tonight, tomorrow, and even the next day, I beg of you, look again, look again. See the trauma and the pain of my community. See the anger and the anxiety. See the tiredness. Look again. Once you have really looked upon our sorrow, once you have set the weight of our sorrow, what you will discover is my city has become your city. My pain has become your pain. That young person protesting has become your young person grieving. That kid looting has become your kid weeping. Do not look away. For then and only then will you truly be with us. Look again. Now let's return to our beloved sanctuary where I'll light the chalice symbol of Unitarian Universalism. Good morning. I'm Lynn Jacoby, the membership coordinator of First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee. And this is Susan Borey, our membership team co-chair. We're here to welcome a group of people who recently completed our journey to membership class and just this past Wednesday joined our congregation. New members, welcome. I wanted to share with you that this past Tuesday at a membership team meeting, I asked Susan and the rest of the team in the kind of check-in question that you've become uh, very familiar with in the last four weeks of classes. I asked the team why being a member at First Church was important to them. They mentioned community and connection. One of our members noted this community is the strongest source of his connectedness. They also talked about being part of, part of something larger than themselves and a part of a faith practice that is open to both mystery and questions. The team mentioned working with others towards the common good and refuge. They mentioned spiritual growth and aliveness. I tell you because they echo so much of what I heard from you in our classes and why you are seeking a church. And I tell you because I know this community sincerely hopes that you also find these things that we all value so much here. One of the team members, Sherry Briscoe, noted she wouldn't live in a community that did not have a Sierra Club, a League of Women Voters, and a Unitarian Universalist Church. I thought I knew what she was getting at, but so I called her to confirm. Being a Unitarian Universalist is part of Sherry's identity. And it's true, when we know who we are, what we value, we understand the commitments we want to make to help ourselves live into those values. And we also want to be with others who want to help together to nurture those values in our world. New members, I welcome you, we all welcome you to a community where seekers have been coming for 175 years to practice connection and love. We welcome you to a faith that says, our answers will vary, but the ongoing search for truth and meaning in our lives is valuable. 
We welcome you to a congregation and that knows working towards dignity and justice for all is part of practicing our faith. And we welcome you to a people who understand our lives are interconnected and interdependent with all of life. New members, I invite you to join me from your homes or wherever you are in a covenant with your new congregation by repeating these fine words after me. But first, uh, everyone else in the congregation, please imagine in the pauses a group of fabulous voices addressing you with these words. We enter this congregation with hope and possibility in our hearts and pledge to participate in and support the ministries of this church. We covenant to dwell together in peace, to speak the truth in love, and to help one another. We seek your welcome as we join you in this faith. Members, Susan are now going to lead the rest of you um, through your part in, in your part of our welcoming covenant. And now members, please join me in giving our new members a virtual welcome. Please repeat after me out loud in your own home or wherever you may be these words. We welcome you as once we were welcomed ourselves. We bid you welcome who come with weary spirit seeking rest. We bid you welcome who come with hope in your heart. We bid you welcome, who are seekers of a new faith. We bid you welcome, who entered this virtual space as a homecoming, who find in this people a family. In their, in their final journey to membership class this past week, our new members introduced themselves to you. Here's what they had to say. Hi everyone, my name is Jenny Abel and I'm looking forward to engaging in social justice activities with others at, the, at First Church. I'm David Tripp, and I'm looking forward to connecting with like-minded people. <clears throat> Angie Brist, and I'm looking forward to being part of a bigger community of like-minded people. I'm Lila Doubt, and I'm Lila Doubt, and uh, my word is interconnectedness. I'm Alan Jacobson, and my word is I'm home. I am Megan Kaminsky, and my word is I want to be a sense of this particular community because I enjoy it so much. I lit the cam uh, candle, so I'm looking forward to joining all of you in your journey, and my word is hope. Hello. 
My name is Sean. And I am looking forward to community and engagement. Sean Alineback. <clears throat> my name is Kathy Miller, and I'm my word is love. Good morning. I'm, I'm Dan O'Keefe. And I very much, I'm very glad to be home again. I'm Elizabeth O'Leary, and my word is unity. Um, I feel also like I've found a home. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Lindsay Sheridan and I am feeling um, curious and inspired. Hello. I am Trudy Watt, and I'm really delighted to be rediscovering congregation. Hello, my name is Dawn Zant, and my word is community. And my name is John Zant, and I am excited, excited to participate in this community and to put some thoughts about social and environmental justice into action. Thank you, everyone. That was just beautiful. You all did a great job. Welcome, welcome new members. It's so wonderful to have you. I am so sorry this morning uh, to share with you all the news of a death in our community. Jean Lowry died peacefully on Thursday evening, May 21st with her family by her side. Jean suffered a fall and a head injury on May 19th. She was hospitalized and diagnosed with an intracranial hemorrhage. She was 69 years old and she was a beloved member of our congregation for 25 years. A 49-day Buddhist ceremony will be held on Zoom by the family, open to all. A memorial service at the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee will be scheduled in the future when gathering can be done safely. In lieu of flowers, memorial donations may be made to the guest house, Street Angels Milwaukee Outreach and Milwaukee Mindfulness Practice Center. Thus, as is our tradition in this church, whenever we have a birth, an adoption, or a death among our members, we light our candle of life 
today in honor of Jean Lowry. As we enter into a time of meditation, which will be followed by silence, followed by spirit of life, I invite you to do whatever you need to do to get comfortable in your body. Maybe that means feeling your feet on the floor grounding you. Or maybe it means feeling the top of your head connecting you to all that is. Maybe it means feeling the air moving in and out of your lungs and bringing you into being here and now. Spirit of life and love, Holy One of our being and our becoming, that which is sacred within among and beyond us. Be with us today in all that is. Be with us in the truth and the beauty of a new day that we woke up and also in all the grief and the pain and the lamentation. Be with us as we hold both the loss of a hundred thousand people to COVID-19 and the continuing pain of murderous racism and white supremacy. This world holds so much. Our hearts hold so much. Help us be witness to all that is let us heart, our hearts both break and heal. And let us be transformed into agents of healing in the world. May it be so. Now let's return for a moment to our beloved sanctuary where the singing bowl will frame our shared silence and then we can sing Spirit of Life.
My name is Jeff Piercy. It's my pleasure to serve as worship associate this morning. Every generation has a threshold time that forever changes society and individuals. My generation's threshold was the year 1968. Life was different in 1967 and forever changed by the events of 1968. Some remarkable strides were made, but the fabric of our country was torn apart and at war. It was the year of the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, a turning point in that war. President Johnson chose not to run for re-election. There were strong leaders. Robert Kennedy began his run to the presidency. Reverend Martin Luther King was pushing for equal rights. Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Riots happened in more than 100 cities, leaving 39 people dead, 2,600 injured, and 21,000 arrested. I was a sophomore in college in 1968. Young people were leading the protest movements. We were not able to stand on the sidelines. We made choices about the draft, about war, about who we were. We got in the streets. We raised our fists and knocked on doors to change elections. We made our voices known about race. We got in the streets. We were forever changed. Of course, we messed up. We had no understanding of our privilege as young white people. We talked when we should have listened. We often shouted even if we did not know what we were shouting about. Many things changed after 1968, but we still exist in a racist society. We are still divided politically. We still are willing to shut down voices, stomp out dissent, and yearn for a yesterday that actually never existed. I don't mean to discount the enormous strides that were made post-1968. Our modern society of fair housing, the feminist movement, access to education and health care are all part of the progress that was made. Like all thresholds, we bring things in when we enter and we leave things behind as we depart. In 1968, I left behind my innocence and my naivete. I took along a willingness to work for change. But now, I believe we are in the midst of a new threshold period of time for an entire generation of young people. This generation will define itself by the COVID-19 pandemic, the impact on education, the economy, world affairs, politics, and racial disparity. The shutdown has put our country and this generation into a pressure cooker. Like in 1968, the fear dominates the protectors of the status quo. Racial disparity has been demonstrated in the rate of infection and death in minority communities by the preponderance of minority people as essential workers, especially that are not directly part of the healthcare delivery system. The first of the explosions of the pressure cooker were triggered by violence against African-Americans. This next generation will be defined by this threshold event. How it responds will shape every aspect of the world. In the aftermath of 1968, meaning could only be created by reflection, action, and involvement. I refuse to be bullied by the saying, America, love it or leave it. I came to the frightening conclusion that I had to be part of the solution. Otherwise, I was the problem. Mm. Oh, thank you so much for that reflection, Jeff. I'm grateful for it. <sighs> this week, the world witnessed the videotaped lynching of another unarmed Black man in America. On Monday, May 25th, George Floyd was murdered by an on-duty Minneapolis Police Department officer, Derek Chauvin, in broad daylight while bystanders tried to intervene and three other officers stood by. I'm not going to describe George's death because his life, his life was inherently worthy as a beautiful and beloved child of this world. And he deserves more than all of us ogling and repeating the awful circumstances of his death. Moreover, our Black members and friends don't need to be re-traumatized 
with horrific descriptions of violence against Black people. And I want to be clear that this is trauma. Black people and all people are going through collective trauma right now. Watching a lynching is trauma. Anytime we human beings experience trauma, it touches on all the previous trauma we've experienced. In the United States of America, Black people have been experiencing racial violence and trauma for over 400 years. The Reverend Bill Singford, the first African-American president of the Unitarian Universalist Association and the first African-American president of any majority white religious denomination who I'm sure you remember visited us at First Church at the end of February this year, wrote the following message to his congregation, the First Unitarian Church of Portland this week. I don't know what to write to you. I am a love preacher. I try to convince you and myself every week that love is real and hope is justified despite all of the evidence to the contrary. But I would be deceiving you if I tried to pretend that each new murder does not threaten my own faith. I am lightly touched by the violence of the police state in which we live, while protected by the many privileges I enjoy, but I know that it so easily could be me. Every person of color lives with that knowledge. I will not offer you a simplified and sanitized hope. The most I can offer you is an invitation. For those of you who are white identified and even those of you who are black, indigenous and people of color, an invitation to be present to the lack of hope. Not an invitation to a pity party, not an invitation to despair, an invitation to cease pretending the Reverend Sinkford continues. The challenge is not to punish one white police officer in one city for one act of violence. We, that would be all of us, need to face the truth that so much of the structure of the world we know is built on a commitment to maintain the racial hierarchy. We must face it if we want to have any chance of changing it. The words of prophet James Baldwin, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Reverend Sinkford continues, we must face the truth. We must be present to it, visit the depression and the hopelessness that is part of the truth I must know. That is part of the truth I invite you to know in yourself, if that truth is present in you or through me and other people of color, if this is as close to this truth as you can approach. Let us individually and together face the truth, name it, so that we do not remain in either denial or despair, but can emerge more certain of where our hope lies and more willing to move towards it. <sighs> I am so very grateful to Reverend Sinker, Sinkford for that brutally honest invitation to us to visit the truth and be present to it. I've heard so many of my Black friends and colleagues say how tired 
they are right now, exhausted. Christine Edgar, who's a Black Unitarian Universalist in Seattle, Washington, wrote, I feel like I've been constantly screaming, stop killing us inside my head for the past few weeks. It's all too much, and I am not okay. Most Black people living in America are not either. We are in pain. Black people in America are in pain. This is too much. It's another lynching on video, followed by another process of struggling for justice, struggling to hold police officers accountable for violence against black and brown people. Another time of having to work so very hard of having to struggle and protest and march in the streets for something that so rarely happens and something that should happen all the time. Stop killing us. It's not a complicated demand. And when murder does happen, hold the murderer accountable in the same way that all the other murderers are held accountable. Grief, trauma. When an individual person experiences trauma, it gets stored in the brain in a different way than other memories. And when that memory gets touched, it feels like the individual is living through the experience again. When that happens, the human body reacts with fight or flight or freeze. In his incredible book, My Grandmother's Hands, Resma Menachem writes about collective trauma, how trauma is stored in our bodies and it is passed down over generations collectively. This kind of historical collective trauma is in the bodies of Black people, but also non-Black people of color and white people. The wounds of racism and white supremacy are imprinted in all of our, of our bodies. The trauma is stored there intergenerationally as communities and passed down. What we're experiencing right now is both present and historic. Our very bodies have been shaped by the past, by our own individual past, but also the trauma of previous generations. And that knowledge is encoded and stored in our bodies. It's not possible to talk about this moment, the grief, the rage, the unrest, the fear. It's not possible to talk about it outside the historical context of slavery and Jim Crow and the new Jim Crow of mass incarceration. It's impossible to talk about George Floyd's murder or Derek Chauvin's choice to commit murder to continue doing what he was doing despite being told that it was killing George Floyd. It's not possible to talk about those things outside the history of the police department's role in race in this country. It is impossible to talk about black resistance or rage against the police without that context it's not possible to talk about white attachment to law and order or civility without understanding the context of the role that the institution of the police, the institution of the police, not individual police officers, but it as an institution with a long history 
the institution of the police has played a role in slavery, in Jim Crow, and in the new Jim Crow of mass incarceration. And that's the context in which we are living. That's the context that lives in all of our bodies. Carrie McDonald, the vice president of the Unitarian Universalist Association wrote yesterday, a few years ago, I bought a textbook on law enforcement. It's called The Police in America, an Introduction by Samuel Walker and Charles Katz. If you were taking a course on law enforcement, say to train to be a police officer, you might be assigned this book. Chapter two is a history of policing. And the following is a quote from that chapter in that policing textbook. The slave patrol was a distinctly American form of law enforcement intended to guard against slave revolts and capture runaway slaves. In some respects, the slave patrols were actually the first modern police forces in this country. The Charleston, South Carolina Slave Patrol had about 100 officers in 1837, and it was far larger than any Northern city police force at that time. I grew up in Racine, Wisconsin, just 45 minutes south of here learning that the police are there to protect me. My white parents never had to have the talk with me the way that black parents have to have the talk with their black children. My relationship to the police as a white woman is different than black people's relationship to the police. We've seen video after video of white people calling the police on black people because they wanted to control them in one way or another. This week, on the same day that George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis when the police were called on him, a video went viral of a white woman in New York City threatening to call the police on a black man, Christian Cooper, because Christian asked her to leash her dog. The woman did not want to do so, and she told Christian she was going to call the police on him, and she was going to tell the police that a black man was threatening her. As soon as she got on the phone, the angry voice that she was using to speak with Christian changed and became teary and scared as she repeated again and again that there was a black man threatening her and she was afraid. That white woman believed that the police were there, that they existed and would come to protect her and to act in her interest. She believed that they would come and control Christian Cooper. She believed that her phone call to the police meant that the police would do what she wanted. Why did she believe that? I want to ask you if you are white to consider what kind of relationship you have with the police and what the history of that relationship is. How many generations does that perspective go back? And how might your relationship and history with the police, might, how, how might it be different than a black person's or the black community's relationship and history with the police? How might they be different? Calling the police can act as a threat 
against a black person, no matter what they have or have not done. Time and again, we have witnessed that calling the police, even by a black person themselves, can be fatal to black and brown people. This week, the Unitarian Universalist Association put out some alternatives to calling the police for our congregations to consider. Alternatives that are, built, that are based in community-built safety. We're going through an episode of collective trauma right now. Trauma upon trauma. Jeff was right when he said that the pandemic and its collective trauma, which has disproportionately killed black people is raising tensions around the trauma we're experiencing from, Gre from George Floyd's lynching. As human beings, when we're traumatized or triggered, we struggle more to empathize and we struggle more to rationalize. It's hard to face our collective and deep and ancestral wound of race, this bloody gash in our nation's history, hard to face racism and white supremacy and the legacy of horrific violence when we're already tired and scared. Black people are bone weary exhausted. And white folks and non-black people of color are struggling too. It is a really hard time to do serious reflective work about how the history of race and policing is encoded in our bodies. But that is what we are being called to do. Examining our own relationships with the police and how they've been influenced by both our individual experiences, which differ vastly, and also our collective experiences and ancestral experiences could open us up to understanding each other more. Beginning to explore how individual and historical trauma is part of our reactions and our perspective, perspectives could open us up to healing. Dismantling the systems of racism and white supremacy that were built and maintained over 400 years is not easy. And sadly, it has not been quick. Many people are asking right now, what can I do? And the answer is the same. It is the same that it has been. You can be part of the long haul, deep work of dismantling systems of racism and white supremacy. That will mean, that will mean education, yes, for some, for folks who don't know about those systems, but for folks who are already aware, it's about organizing and relationships and building power and system change. For some white folks, transformative work in this moment might look like a radical reassessment of the historic and contemporary role of the police in our society and how different communities have experienced that institution over generations. For some black folks, transformative work might look like dreaming of and living into visions of black wholeness. For some non-black people of color, transformation might look like supporting black visions of wholeness and also tending to your own particular and complex relationships with systems of racism and white supremacy as well as to your own heart healing and liberation. In Minneapolis, there's an organization called the Black Visions Collective that's committed to a long-term vision in which 
all Black lives not only matter, but are able to thrive. The Black Visions Collective believes in a world where all Black people have autonomy, safety is community-led, and people are in right relationship with ecosystems. They're holding out a vision, not just of being welcome, but being at a buffet of beauty and abundance and safety and liberation and healing justice. The Black Visions Collective is organizing. They're doing the work on the ground in Minneapolis and they're accepting donations. May the world follow the lead of Black visionaries who are calling it, us into greater wholeness and healing, dismantling systems of white supremacy and racism. May we follow the lead of the folks who are calling us into a more whole world that's healed of this trauma. May we heal ourselves and each other and be part of the healing of the world. May it be so. Good morning. We know this coronavirus pandemic is affecting our members in many different ways, but for those of us who are able to give right now, it is more important than ever to share our resources with people who have been harder hit by the pandemic. Our church supports members and friends of our congregation spiritually, emotionally, and materially, and supports people in Milwaukee through our relationships with our community partners. Your pledges are the foundation of our congregation and the core of our spiritual practice of generosity. In addition, we are grateful for non-pledge gifts from folks who appreciate our online ministry and are benefiting from it. We also have a special fund for people who need financial support called the Minister's Discretionary Fund. You can give to the church by texting 73256 with the message give to UU dollar sign. The word give, the number two, UU dollar sign. Follow the prompts and choose pledge payment, non-pledge gift, or minister's discretionary. You can also give to First Church by going to our web-based giving link on realm.org slash FUSM slash give slash First Church. You can see both these options on your screen. We also encourage you to give directly to our community partners. You can find a list of their needs on our website at uumilwaukee.org slash support dash Milwaukeeans dash COVID-19. That link should be on your screen as well. Today, we're highlighting the work of the Interchange Food Pantry, which feeds people from all over Milwaukee. To give to Interchange, go to the GoFundMe page at the link on your screen, or you can go to GoFundMe.com and search for Interchange Food Pantry. All of your offerings to our community partners and to First Church will be gratefully received. And now, as always, as always, but especially at this time when our interdependence is so evident, thank you for your generosity.
Thank you so much, Jack Forbes Wilson, for ministering to our hearts with such beauty. We are so lucky and grateful. This is hard, my dear ones. <laughs> this is hard and it's not getting any easier. We need to be honest about that. It will help us see more clearly, like the Reverend Sinkford said, where the hope lies in grieving honestly, and then in healing our hearts and our communities from personal and collective racial trauma, and then building relationships and power to dismantle systems of racism and white supremacy. The work of love is here as it's always been. The work of love continues and we're in it together following the leadership of Black visionaries for healing justice. I love you, First Church. Be well. We'll see you next Sunday. Let's return to our beloved sanctuary now to extinguish the chalice and then listen to our postlude, which is yet another love note to you from Jack Forbes Wilson. the dawn somehow in the sky high above them that old moon shines now where a jet plane twinkles in the starry sky and it's hard to imagine there are folks that high eating nuts and peering through the atmosphere trying hard to imagine there are folks down here. So good night, everybody, and good night, all things. We will sleep close together till the alarm clock rings. We may range from the ocean to the end of space, but in time's estimation, we're in one small place. by the ocean oh so far away whom I left in the evening of a bygone day I will go back to see them once again I vow but what gives me the shivers is they're there right now I won't feel that I'm going till I start to pack I won't feel like I've been there till the slides come back And when we stand together by the deep blue sea I will not quite believe that it is really me So good night everybody and good night all things We will sleep close together till the alarm clock rings we may range from the ocean to the end of space, but in time's estimation, we're in one small place.
place Though the flights to the moon have been in some decline I remember the eagle back in 69 That they walked on the moon is not as wild somehow As the fact there are footprints on the moon right now and we all go exploring on our separate ways. We take off on vacations by ourselves for days. But we're always together and we're home at last. At the spot where the future meets the dear old past. So good night, everybody, and good night, all things. We will sleep close together till the alarm clock rings. We may range from the ocean to the end of space, but in time's estimation, we're in one small place.